<clears throat> All right, well, this week's Torah portion is Amor, means to speak. And just so you know, this Torah portion is really a, for the Kohanim, for the priests, the laws and regulations uh, that they need to follow when the temple, the tabernacle or the temple are in place. Um, and what's interesting is that that it goes into um, when we it's a it's a mitzvah it's a good deed to uh, attend to the dead, right? But God gives a different application here for His priests. Um, he is not to make himself unclean for any of his people who dies. Okay, not to. But he make God does make an exception for the regular kohanim, except for his close relatives, his mother, father, son, daughter, and brother. He may also make himself unclean for his virgin sister who is never married and is therefore dependent on him. Okay, those are the people he can make himself unclean for, right? Um. And the reason is, is because God is holy. God is life. And when we are around death, that causes us to be impure. And so the Kohanim, even though he can make himself impure for his those family members, he cannot do so for others. Okay? So a Kohan isn't going to uh, perform a... Uh, um, Funeral, thank you. I don't know why I had it there. Uh, a funeral, okay? Not like a a rabbi who's not a Kohen or a pastor or somebody like that, right? Or a Catholic priest. You know, they they, all, they they will attend to the to that part of it. But a Kohen can't be unless it's one of those stipulations there. Not that they're going to perform the service either, but they will be be there to mourn their family. And what's interesting too is that in Judaism, even to this day, um, in Israel, you see that that when a person dies, they're buried the same day. Now, here in America, you know, a lot of funerals that you know of, they they might not be for a week or two weeks or three weeks in the road. But God has commanded Israel to lay their people in the grave the day that they die. Now, in Judaism, they do make um, um, exceptions for when family is too far away and need to get there. Then it might be three days. But no longer than that. Okay? So so that's, that's a tough thing for those who don't live close by. That's why it's so important... Um, uh, for families to live close together, you know. Also, for a community to live together, close together, uh, because in that community, um, when someone dies, they have a organization that uh, helps guard the body, helps prepare the body for burial. Unlike Christian uh, funerals, it's always a closed casket, and it's at, and it's at the graveyard okay the cemetery um, and the idea is not that <clears throat> we're forgetting them or anything like that it's that we need to realize that the person is gone now from us we just need to remember the good times that they had but to view the dead body is to become more contaminated in essence and I know I've heard other people talk about touching the dead bodies and incurring uh, curses or evil spirits. Okay? Um, I've heard that from uh, teachers in the past, Christian teachers, about that. But in essence, it's kind of like the same thing, is that you incur impurities. Okay? Um, that's one of the reasons why we bury them as soon as we can. We have a, we have a service for them. See, like now in Israel, um, they don't use caskets. They wrap them in white material, okay? And in some instances for soldiers and stuff, uh, they have the Israeli flag that they drape on them. Um, but they're buried 
without a casket in the ground. Um, and you'll see that like on, uh, on uh, uh, east side of the walls of Jerusalem, the big cemetery there. And you see these boxes that will go on almost like forever, it seems. Um, a lot of people, that's a, that is a uh, um, uh, premium spot to be able to be buried there because it's following the uh, the teaching that when the Messiah comes, he's going to come to that eastern gate and that he's going to step foot there and all the dead there are going to rise and enter into the kingdom. That's one of the ideas they have there. Um, but for the Kohanim, who has the anointing on God, of God on them, right? They can't do those same things that everybody else to be able to mourn in a different way. And we've seen that with Aaron and his two sons, Nadav and Avihu, who died bringing a foreign fire uh, incense with a foreign fire, not off the altar, but from some other place, who died before God. And the priests, uh, their brothers weren't even allowed to touch them. They had to be their cousins who came in and took them out to outside the camp to a holy place where they would be buried. Because <coughs> God's anointing is on them and God is life. And so when these things happen, life is purity and God is not going to be around death. That's why, um, other than the animals that were used for offerings, uh, the person with Sara'at, which is symbolically a living dead in a sense, um, because they were to be outside the camp, outside the city, living in a separate place, calling themselves impure, impure, not because they had sinned, but because they had. Uh, because they come down with a sarat from one of the skin diseases that the Torah talks about. And so they have to uh, be unkempt and wear something over their mouth to call people, hey, I'm, I'm impure, don't come by me, because they can transfer their impurities. But it wasn't sin, it's impure, impurity. But once they were healed, then they could go to the priest, and actually the priest would come out to them, as we have read before. The priest would come out to them and check them over, and if they were definitely clean, then they'd have to follow the the rules that God has set up for final cleansing, final purification. And then they could come in. And one of the things we see in here too is God is saying also who of the Kohanim can bring his food to him, his, his offerings, right? And which is interesting is that if you have a defect, you weren't allowed. You weren't allowed to uh, bring the offering to God. If you were, it says um, they cannot approach with a defect. No one blind, lame, with mutilated face or a limb too long, broken foot or a broken arm, hunched back, stunted growth cataract in his eye, festering and running sores or damaged testicles, right? So these people weren't allowed to bring the gift of, God, uh, of their God, the bread of their God to God in the temple. But as long as they were pure, they were allowed to eat it in the holy place, okay? Um, and so in a sense, these people represent, uh, in, a, in a way, when we look at it, they represent people who are not priests, um, who, because our defect is in it. God even says it in there that, that uh, the defect is in the people, and we are the people. And so the defect is that, that our holiness, like we were talking about last week, is lacking a letter. It's lacking. But through Yeshua, who is the high priest of the heavenly temple, brings us into that holiness to allow us to 
compete with our God, to get the better of our God, right? Not that we can bring it, bring it to him. Yeshua is our mediator. He brings it for us. But we get the, as long as we're pure in that sense, then we are able to uh, partake in the food that God provides for us. It's another reason why, um, why God commanded us that when we've eaten our fill, then to give thanks to God. But it's okay to pray beforehand because we see that Yeshua did and even the Pharisees uh, did the blessings before eating the food. We see that today. And then when we're done, we should sit together. When we're done, take care of our plates and stuff, sit together and then bless God. I know there is Birchat Hamazon, the blessings after a meal that they do have. It's not always necessary to, to do that, but just giving thanks to God. When we eat, when we have eaten our fill. You know, um, and the food of the food that God gives us is from his spirit, spiritual food. And really, it's, you know, reading his word, studying his word, studying and not just studying, but put into action what he has given to us. So it's like like food. Then we take food in. It goes into our body and gives us energy to be able to do the things we need to do. And so it's the same thing with God's spirit that he gives to us that for our spiritual food, that it comes into our spirit and it nourishes our spirit so that we can do the works of the spirit. It's kind of like we were talking about last night at the Rev Shabbat um, about uh, worshiping God in spirit. Yeshua said in, in John, Yohanan, that um, God is spirit, and those who worship God must worship him in spirit. And so when we do the prayers and blessings, it's not something we're doing because we have to do or because it's tradition or everybody else is doing it. It's because we want to do this for God so that we remember the goodness, the, the great things he has done for us and is doing for us. Right? We do these things to remind ourselves. He doesn't need our prayers. He doesn't need our blessings, our food, or anything like that. It's like a, even in one of the um, blessings in the Birkat Hamazon, it says that, that he gives us food to enjoy and to give thanks to him. Okay? And so that's what I was getting at last night, too, about making sure that you know, we pray. There's, you know, we know, we know there's three times a day that, that uh, they have opportunities to pray, three three different prayer times during the day, but we don't have, you know, we can pray any time. And when we pray, it's like, it's like talking to your friend, to your best friend next to you, right? And that's what we need to realize. But, we, you know, we're not going to say anything to our best friend that hopefully we're going to hear that um, is going to embarrass us or embarrass them or uh, cause them to trip or fall, right? We be respectful, right? Especially because we're praying for God. So our prayers should be respectful, right? And like I was saying too, is that when we pray, we thank, and the, the idea, the how Jewish prayer goes is that we thank God, we remind him of his promises and we thank him for all that he's done for us, and then we then pray for others. And the last ones we should pray for are ourselves, right? Others first, ourselves last, right? Just like Abraham. Abraham is the uh, example that Yeshua even taught us about, that God wants us to see. Yeshua walked in the, the footsteps of Abraham. Abraham invited the stranger into his camp. He would feed him and he would teach them about the one true God. That's how he gained thousands of uh, uh, converts, uh, thank you, converts that joined his camp. And then when he left uh, to go to the promised land that God was taking him to, it says that uh, that he took with him all the 
converts or the, all the souls that he had made. And for some reason, a lot of the English Bibles translate that as slaves. Um, but it actually says souls that he made. There is no Hebrew word there for slaves in there. So where they get that, don't know. I suppose because they say, well, it's logical. He probably just he bought and sold sla slaves. you know. But, but then we lose what God's trying to tell us is that that he, Abraham, was a Sheliak of God, just like he was one, an apostle of God. He taught strangers about the one true God. And they would, they believed and they would take hold of Abraham and they went with him. Sure, some of them served him, stuff like that. We do know that. But remember, Abraham, th those people weren't regular servants, so they weren't harsh. That's why God gives uh, instruction for those who do have slaves. They're not your property. They're human beings. You need to treat them with respect. They're made in my image. They're not for you to abuse. They're not for you to do whatever you want to them. They're human beings and they need to be respected. Um, even though today we, you know, we look down on slavery because <coughs> mankind, when it comes to slavery, is without these things in place, we're cruel. cruel even, and we see that even today, like in the Islamic world, with their slaves. Yes, they have slaves today. Their largest group of slaves they have come from Africa, and yet the United States is blamed for its past. Well, yeah, I agree. You know, it's something we, it's a black mark on our country, but we did do something about it. But nobody talks about the African slaves that are in the Islamic countries still slaves, or the unbelievers or infidels that they gather uh, to be slaves in those countries. And they are treated horribly, even the women. You know, the women. Islam are considered less than uh, a camel. And so they treat them very poorly. But yet, because of the, what they call that syndrome, the women are in basic captive, huh? Stockholm Syndrome. Stockholm syndrome. Uh, that's been going on for generations there. That's why uh, they, don't, they don't see anything wrong with it because they've been brought up in it. And if a woman does speak up against it, she doesn't survive very long. Yes. Well, that, that has had people try to make that happen in the past. I mean, in China, that was the thing that... In China? How about the people are missing in this country? Oh, yeah. Well, no, she's, she's just mean, talking about the little Uyghur. The Uyghur, yeah. But we also have that thing going on in our country, too. Yes, the Chinese are doing horrible things to, to, to the, the Uyghurs, who are Muslim, which... No, it, sh it shouldn't be going on. But like I said, human beings do these cruel things to each other. Um, human trafficking, which is a big problem. It's not just a huge problem here. It's a huge problem in the whole world. They're, they're most likely slave traders, sex slave traders in particular. Slave traders nonetheless, no different than the ones that brought slaves to America. And to be honest, they're kidnapped, right? And so the Torah even teaches us that, that a kidnapper should be put to death. Whether the person is still with them or they've sold them someplace. The kidnapper, or in this case the trafficker, should get the death penalty. Not live in uh, luxury at, at uh, prison and stuff, but they should be. That should be an automatic thing. I mean, I don't necessarily believe in the death penalty. Because so many people have, and a lot of people who have uh, died innocently who were innocent because of uh, corruption and stuff like that. But when it comes out, no doubt that these people are slave, uh, uh, slave traders, uh, abductors of girls, even boys. Um, they should get the death penalty. I know people talk about pedophiles. Well, uh, okay, pedophiles and stuff, but. I think it's worse. I mean, yeah, I think it's bad, believe me, that what they do, too. But it's worse kidnapping somebody and selling them into the sex trade. Because usually they're young girls, young kids. And that's just as bad. Huh? Yeah, in some Yep. Yes.
it's getting a lot worse. People are posting um, videos of their little children doing gymnastics or, you know, doing something that would otherwise be kind of innocent, but then they're putting background music that's very sexual, and people are saving those How videos. about child? Dress, dressing them up like whores. And look at that Jean Bonnet Ramsey. Yeah. The parents should go to jail for that. Yes. Uh, yesterday, when we were in Target, we, we, wa we were walking by these clothes for little girls, and one of them, they had like open sides. Yeah. Huge yeah. part of their dress shown on this dress yeah. in Target. Yeah. yeah. Well, you got to realize Target is full of. Uh, Cor corruption, huh? A lot of the products in Target are crap, anyways. But um, they promote. Yeah, Target promotes pedophilia in a big way. Pedophilia and the. And also with that one LGBTQ whatever. Yeah. They. Yeah, they promote alternate lifestyles that are not biblical. And we got to be careful of that, you know. we got to be careful of that. That's why I really don't shop at Target, and there's other places too. I like to shop at Lucan's, Marketplace, Walmart. Aldi's is good. You know, they got a lot of good stuff. And you can find a lot of kosher stuff too, which is good. But we have to watch out for our children. Anyways, <laughs> all those type of things make a person impure, right? And... The priest is called to a high standard. And that's the thing, too, about the Pharisees. You know, a lot of people complain about the Pharisees. They've been taught that the Pharisees were bad people, evil people. You know, the church teaches this stuff. But yet Yeshua was a Pharisee. He wouldn't have been invited to sit with the Pharisees if he wasn't. That's one thing. Um, the other thing is, is that he had no time or patience for the Sadducees. So... But he had no problem sitting and talking with Pharisees. Uh, we see that uh, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea were both high-ranking Pharisees. Um, we see, too, after uh, Yeshua's death and resurrection and ascension that many of the Jewish people that were coming to faith were Pharisees, still Pharisees. Rav Shaul, Rabbi Paul, was a Pharisee. Proud that he was a Pharisee. Not necessarily all the things he did, but proud that he was a Pharisee, a Pharisee of Pharisees, he says. And the Pharisees, when we see this, we look at them, and this is why I want to talk about this, is that in Babylon, we didn't have a temple, right? The temple was destroyed. And so the men of the great assembly help write the blessings and stuff that we have. And from that point on, they also took upon themselves uh, just like the priests with immersion and purity laws, that's where those came into effect. To be like the, 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 the priests, priests of our own home. Because a husband, a father, in his home is to be like a high priest in his home. And in so doing is where they came with, uh, other than from Psalm 24, is the washing of the hands before they eat. And the concept that if you don't wash your hands, then you, know, you could have touched something that's impure. You know? But of course, if, you're, if you did touch something impure, you're impure already. It wouldn't matter if you didn't wash your hands and ate something anyways, because you're already impure. Right? But Yeshua takes it one step beyond that. And he says that, that you know, it, it doesn't matter if you wash your hands. It's not what goes into your body, talking about food, that uh, makes you unclean. It's not whether you wash your hands or do wash your hands that's going to make somebody pure or impure. It's what comes out of his mouth, out of his heart. Right? Um, so the washing of hands, it's a good thing to wash your hands before you eat anyways. But that's talking about a uh, with soap and stuff like that because you never... You know, you know, it might have some bacteria or something like that on there. You don't want to pass that on to yourself or anybody else. But also to just eat as if you're eating to God. That's why in the household here, um, our table is 
like the altar to God, right? And we're like the priests and the, and, uh, and the people of Israel, um, the Levites and the people of Israel. And when we sit down at the table, it's not a time, you know, sit down to eat at the table together as a family and stuff. Like what I was saying last night is a lot of families don't do this anymore. They have all the gaming equipment and computer games, stuff like that, and they just grab food and go sit in there and eat. They don't even eat as a family anymore, which is lost. But in our household, I know that happens, but on Friday nights, we eat together as a family at the table and sanctify it, set it apart for God, and set apart the Sabbath for God. And we eat together. We'll eat together here for lunch and so forth. Um, and there's times that we do get together and have a meal together at the table too. But primarily, I always do it Friday night because that is important. It's different from the rest of the week because the Sabbath is different. And that's why we need to do that. Why uh, it's good to understand uh, these rules that God came up for the Kohanim, for the priests, right? Are we priests? Well, I mean, there might be some of us that are. But the idea was not to be impure. That's why the Pharisees did what they did because they, they wanted to make sure that they were that they were pure for God, that they could do God's service, teaching, whatever it might be. And the Pharisees were, if anything, the people of Israel loved the Pharisees because they were like their, their own people. They would uh, take care, they, they helped feed the poor, helped clothe the poor, they helped the people with so many different things. The Sadducees didn't. Sadducees the people considered the, the Sadducees to be uh, kind of what people think about the rich people today. Snoots just in for themselves and, and power grabbing. huh? Arrogant. Arrogant, yeah, exactly. But the Pharisees weren't. They were a person's person. They helped the poor and whatever else needed to be done. And that's why even Yeshua says that, that unless our righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and the scribes, he wasn't putting them down. I know people look at it, oh, they're putting them down. No. What are they, that they are doing that makes them righteous, but are righteous? He didn't say they weren't righteous. He said, unless we um, do more than what the Pharisees do, you know, we're not going to make it into the kingdom of heaven. We're not going to become righteous. Um, it's not holding to traditions and stuff like that. What he was talking about there is that, yeah, they... They do all these things because they want to be able to draw close to God. But sometimes uh, mankind tends to go a little too far. And in the sense that make commandments that aren't, or make commandments that, uh, that kind of um, cause God's commandments to be null and void. And we have to watch that, that that doesn't happen. And that can happen. That's one of the things that Yeshua talked about about the Pharisees, that they had made some traditions um, causing God's original instructions to be null and void. They went beyond what God was asking. He said it's okay, but don't put it above God's command. He said, he said, you know, you tithe your cumin and your mint and stuff, and, and that's all good. But God didn't say you had to do that. You can do it, but don't put it above what God said to already tithe. Right? Don't think of it as sin. What's that? Or in place of. Thank you. Okay? And we as priests, we as followers of Yeshua, um, just as Yeshua, who is his, the priest of heaven, as Hebrews shows, he's not, the, not a priest here. God already has a priesthood set up here on earth. So Yeshua could never go into the temple and offer sacrifices or go into the Holy of Holies. God would not allow that because God has his priests for the earth. Yeshua is the priest of the heavenly. His priesthood will come during the time um, of the Messianic era, but even more so in the world to come when the new Jerusalem, the new temple, is brought down. Uh, in essence, the king and the prince. That's why even when we take a look at things, why the Hasmoneans were 
the book of Maccabees and stuff weren't included in the regular canonization of the the Tanakh is because they were priests, but they made themselves kings. That's why I was a Josiah went up and offered in place of the priest because he was impatient and he got leprosy, right? He was a good man, a godly man, but he got impatient waiting for the priests to do their job. And so he went and did it. And God said, no, you can't do that. There's only one that king and priest, that's Yeshua. And that will be of the heavenly kingdom, the world to come. That's why even in the in the Messianic age, he's not going to do the sacrifice and stuff like that. People get that confused. It says that he will bring them. He is going to supply the sacrifices for the people. When we do the, the national offerings and stuff like that. I mean, we'll still be bringing our own offerings, however we want to do. But he will bring the offerings for the people for the nation and for the nations. That's why it says also that that uh, those nations that survive when Yeshua comes back and sets up his kingdom in battle, good and evil, of course Yeshua is going to win, and those nations that survive will go to Sukkot. And they bring with them an offering. But it also talks about him that he will, he is the prince. Why? Because he's the son of the king. So, of course, he's the prince, and the prince will bring the offerings for the, for the Israel and for the nations. But there will be a high priest that God has already selected that will, and the other priests that are with him that will do the work of his offerings. It's not until the heaven comes down in the world to come after the Messianic era that the sacrifices, there will be no need for them. But there will be a temple where we can go and draw close to God. Uh, of course, God will be everywhere because there won't be a need for a sun and a moon and stuff like that because God will be light, right? And in that day is when the new covenant will come into its fullness because it says that then no one will need to be taught about God because everybody will know. His Torah will be in our hearts and on our mind. And that's what we get to look forward to. And that's why he gave us all these um, festivals. And the festival reading here, we've read it before. Um, and we'll read it again about the festivals. But these are jobs that the Kohanim are supposed to be doing. He's, he's telling us these things because it is for us too, but it's for the Kohanim how they are going to um, uh, perform their duties on these festivals. And we get into an even more... Uh, description later, I think it's in Deuteronomy, talk about especially for Sukkot, goes through the uh, seven days and the eighth day. And that's what we need to look at too, is that Sukkot was a festival for the nations. There were a total of 70 oxen in the first seven days that were offered up to God on behalf of the nations. Why? Because 70 is the number for the nations. Okay? But on the eighth day, new beginnings, right? One ox. Why? Because we're all one people. Right? We're all united together. There's no need for the other nations, the other offerings. Eighth day is new beginnings. Shemani Atzeret. Okay? So when we understand this stuff, um, these are what God has, want, has wanted the priest, the Kohanim, to do. It's his uh, instructions for them to be pure and be able to perform his duties, okay? He's not saying we can't do the same thing other than we can't bring offerings and stuff like that, but we can live those same things just as they do. Uh, and that's an interesting thing too, which I always laugh when I see people picture the high priest with his long beard and stuff, long hair even, and that's not right because it says in here, one of the instructions is to keep yourself groomed, short hair, short beard. Because if you're offering offering, you got this long beard. That's why he had them tie the urim and tuvium up so that it wouldn't fall down into the sacrifice and get bloody and stuff like that, right? Or swing out. That's the same thing for the beard. So it doesn't get blood and stuff of the sacrifice on it, and you carry it to a place that's not holy on accident. You don't know it, right? I know a lot of people do, and you see that in a lot of pictures that. Um, that are out there of the high priest, but the accurate ones are the ones that have a short beard and short hair. 
is so that that doesn't happen because you can't, they are not allowed to transfer the holiness to something that's not holy, something that's common, right? And holy is something that means it's set apart for God, right? We set, like the Sabbath is set apart. Um, but what's uh, unholy just means something common or everyday, right? Like Monday or Sunday through Friday, those are common days. Those are ordinary days. But the Sabbath is to be holy, is to be set apart. And that's what God is talking about. Sanctify. We sanctify the Sabbath. We sanctify his gifts. We sanctify. That's why we say, blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified your Torah, right? Who has sanctified us through your Torah, okay? Sanctify, set us apart because of his Torah. That's why he set apart Israel from the nations. He sanctified them. He set them apart, gave them, their, gave them, gave them his word to live by, instructions, how to dress, how to eat, how to live, how to... Yada yada, right? We see that. And as as believers, as Gentile believers, even as Jewish believers, we need to really take note that this is God's instruction. This is a letter to us, to all of us. And that He's giving us instructions on how to live every day, how to be set apart, how to be holy unto Him. Right? We sing that song, Holy Unto You, right? Well, what does it mean to be holy? It means to be set apart for Him. And if you're Gentiles, you don't, you're not required to keep these things. There are certain things in here that, that are, but most everything isn't. But you, as, it, as it says in the Didache, do as much as you're able to. Keep as much as you're able to. Um, and I'll finish up here. Is that uh, in Acts 15, um, when Paul and the others are before uh, uh, Yaakov, Yeshua's brother, and they're talking about the Gentiles, because you've got one group says they don't have to become Jewish. Along the lines of Hillel too, about conversion. But anyways, God is calling us, because he, he says he's, he's calling both the Jew and the Gentile. But if, there, if all the Gentiles become Jewish, well, then there's no Gentiles that will be part of it, right? And God wants both. The Jews, because he has set them, not because they're better than anybody, I, I when they say chosen, I don't know how many people get offended. Oh, do you think you're so much better than everybody? No. We've been chosen to bring God's word to the rest of the people. We're no different than you. It's just that we have a higher calling that we have to stand before God in the judgment. What did we do with that calling, right? And so the Jew and Gentile come together. That's what Rav Shaul even talked about. Jew and Gentile, new, uh, one new man. To the Jew first, and then to the Gentile. Why? Because the Jew has a higher calling. And then to the Gentile. But we're all part of the Messiah. We're all part of Israel when we accept Yeshua as the Messiah, whether we're Jew or Gentile. And that's why even uh, um, I think it's Paul talks about uh, there's neither Jew nor Greek. Right? In God's kingdom. When we accept Yeshua as Messiah, whether we're Jewish or Gentile, we're all Israel. We all become Israel. When we accept what Yeshua has done for us and who he, what he represents, which is God's Torah, and we apply what is necessary for us to that, the Jew is obligated. The Gentile doesn't have to. There are a few things, as uh, uh, Yaakov HaTadik, James the Righteous, did say, Start them out. No eating blood, no eating meat that's not uh, um, strangled or as it's referred to as, as uh, butchered improperly. No eating anything that's been offered to idols. We can go back to Daniel for that too. That's what, that's what Daniel was talking about. And then stay away from fornication. And remember, fornication isn't just having sex with somebody. Fornication is a couple different things. It's, it's the worship of idols, false gods, and using sex as part of that worship. That's what they used to do. And that's what fornication is. Although it's not good to be to have sex before marriage. It is regulated to the husband and wife. Huh? Premarital sex, yeah, before marriage. So um and it should be in a um in a relationship that uh 
are devoted to each other, that are, uh, what's the word? Um, committed. committed, there we go. A committed relationship, you know. That's what that should be. And so even the, so the, as you can see, the priests are held to a higher degree. Um, we should hold ourselves to a higher degree. Now, we don't have to go overboard. But we need to remember that God has set us apart, sanctified us. Believer, Jewish believer, Gentile believer, God has set us apart for him. These are his instructions for us. And remember, what's interesting too is that um, that he has called us to be a kingdom of priests. Okay, The idea of a kingdom of kings and priests, that's, that's a mistranslation. God calls us to be a kingdom of priests. He doesn't need any kings. He's the king. There's no need for another king. And that's why I hear so uh, kingdom of kings and priests. We're going to be kings and priests. No, we're not. We're going to be priests. It's a kingdom of priests. If you go back. What's that? That's right. That's right. He said, told Israel, don't appoint a king. But if you do, this is what you have to follow, right? But he is the king. He is our king. And there's no need for another king. This part of that is going to be during the uh, Messianic age. I think we'll be going out, like in a sense, like missionaries, going and teaching the world about God, about Yeshua, about His Torah. But we won't be doing that in after the Messianic age, after the thousand years, because we'll be to the world. Everybody's going to know. That's there. Everybody who makes it to that point is going to know. And it's at that point I believe that He will wipe our tears away. He's also going to take our memory of that would cause us to be sad and tearful and maybe regretful and stuff away and just have joy in him. Enter thou the joy of your Lord. Joy. So that's what I have with that. And it's just something that we just need to really look at. And of course, the festivals, it's another thing that sets us apart because we're all pictures of God's plan of redemption and he needed a people and that's why Abraham was chosen because Abraham knew God he loved God he was he says that Abraham was God's friend you know and that he even says to the other angel um, that that we should tell Abraham what's about to go on go take place because he is going to charge his descendants and they will obey my my Torah they will keep my Torah. They will be purified. Okay? So anyways, um, as we go this week, you know, just think about it. How often do we pray? I think prayer is something that is very important. Praying for other people, praying for ourselves, praying for our country, praying for our leaders. Yeah, they make mistakes too, you know. Some of them can be big blunders and some of them... Maybe not so much, but we all make mistakes. And so that's why even in the prayers I do it, that they would repent. They would repent. Not something evil come upon them. Oh, that's not for me. You know, We're not to judge other people in that way, of whether they are saved or not, or if they're going to hell. That's none of your business. Yeah, it does make you perfect because you could be doing stuff maybe you don't even know about that could take you to hell too, but we don't you know. The thing is, is God has sent us Yeshua through him. When we do fall, we repent. It means we turn, get up, turn around, dust ourselves off. A righteous man sins seven times a day, it says in Proverbs. What makes him different than everybody else? What makes him different is that he gets up, seeks forgiveness, repentance, and turns back to God keeps walking with them and that's what we need to do. do the best we can I mean none of us are perfect but we do the best we can because that's what God calls us to do walk in his way best we can I will meet you halfway is what he says Yeshua he sent Yeshua to bring us into the kingdom set us apart sanctify us the rest of the world a peculiar people Right. All right. Bow your heads for the priestly blessing.
Our God and God of our fathers, bless us with the threefold blessing in the Torah written by the hand of Moses, your servant, and pronounced by Haron and his sons, the priests, your holy people, as it is said. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May you will. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May it be your will. May the Lord turn his face toward you and grant you peace. May it be your will. Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Have a good rest of Shabbat. Have a great week this week. Um, next weekend, David and Rivka Costello will be here with their family. And then the Sunday, a week from tomorrow, they'll be doing their teachings from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. We'll have a lunch and supper. Uh, probably some other breaks during that time as well. If you know of anybody who might be interested, um, invite them. I, hopefully it's in the paper. It should be in there today's paper and Wednesday and next Saturday too, but uh, we'll see. Um, and I'll be putting a thing on Facebook for people to see it. Um, pray for journey mercies for them and their little children who will be coming. And then um, um, June, the evening of June 11th starts Shavuot, so uh, the 12th we will have a service here in the morning at 10 a.m. I'll put that in Facebook too. So, um, and then of course our Torah club on Tuesday nights, and we're getting almost done with our Wednesday study for the for the year for the summertime. We'll take a break from that. We'll still continue with Torah club um, and others. So, um, but just be praying for our ministry for growth for witnessing to other people for working in this community, being a blessing to this community, glorifying God. So, but uh, anybody else have anything that maybe I missed or announcements? I know we got graduation next Saturday. Isaac graduates. Um, and then on June 2nd will be his uh, graduation party from, was it 10 to 3? Something, Something like that. <laughs> yeah, however long it takes. Yeah. Yeah, come and hang out. Yeah. I don't remember. I don't remember. It's, it's like a noon to three. I don't remember something like that. Um, but of course, everybody's welcome to that. So, what? Okay. Anyway, so Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Good Shabbos